Hello, everybody. Welcome to Grand Rounds on this Monday, chilly Monday afternoon. We're thrilled to have with us uh, Dr. Tyler Anstead, who's a hospitalist in the Division of Hospital Medicine at the University of Colorado, where he completed his uh, residency training in internal medicine as an inaugural member of the Hospitalist Training Program Leaders Track, and then completed a fellowship in hospital medicine with a focus on quality improvement and health systems leadership. His academic interests lie at the intersection of quality improvement, leadership, and medical education across all levels of learners, and is a faculty member in the Institute for Healthcare Quality, Safety, and Efficiency. We are delighted to have him with us today, Dr. Anstead. Apologies for my technical issues. Take it away. Totally understand. It's that, you know, that auto update thing that really gets us at just the right critical moment. So exactly. <laughs> um, thank you all so much for having me. Uh, this is really a privilege to be able to, to speak with you today about a, a topic that I think is, is really fun uh, and really tangible to what we do within medicine. So I'm going to uh, start sharing my screen and we'll, uh, we'll dive in. All right. Can I get a thumbs up that you can see my screen? Cool. Um, so obviously we're doing this over Zoom. I would love to uh, do this with you in person, but unfortunately the, the state of the world and, and other things is, isn't allowing us to do that. I understand you're now in the red for your masking policy. So I uh, apologize on your behalf that you're having to eat lunch alone and not with other people. So sorry about that, but we're in a similar uh, respiratory viral situation here in Colorado. Um, but it's really nice to be able to do this just at all, which is uh, which is really fun. So thanks so much for having me. Um, one of the things that I'll call out here is that obviously since we're doing this over Zoom, um, I'd ask that a couple things. One, uh, if you feel comfortable with it, would love for you to have your video on. It's nice to feel like I'm talking to a room full of people as opposed to a room full of black screens. Um, the other was uh, just a few uh, Zoom etiquette things. If you're um, not speaking, have yourself on mute. Just a quick reminder. Um, feel free to put questions in the chat. Uh, this will largely be structured based on me talking and then question and answer afterwards but if there's something that comes up i'm happy to keep monitoring the chat and um am able to pause because i want to adapt this to whatever your needs are and i may prompt you for a couple questions uh in there as well so with all of those kind of ground rules let's uh, dive in so this talk is entitled better care through behavioral influence incentives nudging and force kind of force functions um, to achieve better care so again, my name is Tyler Anstead. I am a hospitalist at the University of Colorado Hospital. Um, I also wear a couple other hats within the quality and safety space. Most importantly is I'm uh, one of our associate vice chairs for quality for our department. And then I also serve as our director of quality and safety programs for GME. So essentially helping ensure that all of our GME training programs are meeting their ACGME and other, requir other requirements for quality and safety. So those are my kind of hats that I have to be aware of in my disclosures. Um, here's our uh, learning objectives for the day. I hope by the end of this talk, you will be able to leave uh, with these four things. I'll let you read those in a, for a second. All right, I have no financial disclosures uh, to disclose to you, but one thing I will disclose to you is that much of this work has been um, my own or from my institution. Uh, I, run, I wanted to make it really personal what I shared with you today. Um, and much of this is either in submission for publication or uh, will be very soon. And so I'd ask that this is not uh, reprinted or shared anywhere that you don't uh, swoop me, essentially is what I'm asking, <laughs> asking you for. Um, so really appreciate it on that. So here are the um, kind of main summary of the things that I want you to walk away with today. The first one is that humans and clinicians, we're humans, uh, are lazy, forgetful creatures of habit. That's a universal truth that I want you to keep in your brains. This is that really, as you're trying to get humans to change behavior, uh, that's a really important thing to remember. The next is there's uh, this thing called the hierarchy of inter intervention effectiveness. You want to get humans to change behavior. There are different levels uh, that you can choose to target your interventions and their likeliness of effectiveness. We'll talk a little bit about financial incentives. And then the bulk of what we'll talk about is around this concept uh, from behavioral economics called nudging um, or choice architecture. Uh, this is stuff that's really, that's really fun to think about uh, and where a lot of my um, direct quality improvement work um, really lies. So I'm going to do this through the lens of both some of the background information and literature around these different topics, as well as um, specifically pulling back the curtain on things that we've done from Colorado. Uh, yes, this is what Colorado looks like 365 days of the year. We're, you know, always out on our bikes and this is, you know, idyllic scene. This is exactly what it, it's not exactly what it looks like today, but yeah, you'll, you'll appreciate that. 
All right. So let's talk about like why the heck, you know, we were even talking about change within the healthcare system in general. This has uh, been replicated ad, na ad nauseum, I think is really out there, but I really like this from the Institute of Mes Medicine um, publication around better care at lower cost. This uh, statement really, I think, exemplifies exactly of why we do this work. And that is that we're failing, that as a healthcare system objectively comparatively across the world that we have uh, worse health outcomes and we spend way more money than the other any other industrialized or otherwise um, country in the world and that really our, our failings are uh, global so uh, areas of shortfalls include patient safety evidence basis for care implementing that care coordination access to care and healthcare uh, disparities we really have an opportunity and a imperative to change across all of these different areas. So you might see that as a challenge, or you can see that as an opportunity of where you get involved, you're probably going to make a significant difference because we're deficient in a lot of areas, my own healthcare system included. And it's our job to really make concerted efforts to change this. Now, when I um, present on this stuff, I really like to uh, do this instead of a block of text. I think it's much more digestible to do it as a graphical uh, um, math equation. So we all took a bunch of math, right, to get into medical school and otherwise. And so when you think about improving value, I like to think of it from the value equation of this. This has been replicated in other ways, whether it's you know the, tri the triple aim, then it was the quadruple aim, and I think we're up to the quintuple aim that's usually uh, presented as a pie chart, or you'd, sometimes it's within a block of text. But when we think about improving the healthcare system, specifically improving the value of care that we provide, I like to think of it in this way, because the math gets really easy. So around, along the domains of quality, I like to think of that as practicing evidence-based medicine. We know that from multiple reports, we probably practice evidence-based medicine for when evidence exists about 50% of the time. So really a coin flip of whether or not we're providing evidence-based medicine when evidence exists. And we all know that there's not a lot of evidence for many of the things that we do simply because uh, healthcare and, and, and the human body is complicated. The next one is safety or it's corollary if you want to put it on the bottom, which is harm, which is, you know, our patients getting uh, harmed by interacting with or not interacting with the healthcare system. Um, experience is another one uh, to put in there that was part of the quadruple aim. And one of the things to consider in that is it's not only patient experience that I think is really critical to improving the value of care that we provide, but also provider experience, right? So we know that burned out providers are more biased and make worse decisions than those that are not. So good data that says if, if both patients and providers have a better experience, then the value of care will improve. And then uh, finally, over the last half a decade or so, really thinking about what does equity look like in this space, moving away from everyone should get the same care to everyone should get the right amount of care for them in the right location at the right time. So thinking of this from an equitable standpoint, all of that added up, uh, all divided by cost. Now, if you want to make uh, change happen, really, or if you want to get uh, um, um, uh, supplies or, or uh, things behind your change improvements, you can you can boil that down to dollars, but it doesn't always have to be dollars. It can be time, it can be harm, it could be some of these other things. And again, in order to improve value, the math gets really easy here, right? So uh, you either got to increase the top or decrease the bottom or some combination therein. So when you're thinking about um, making changes or making improvements to the healthcare system, I like to think of it within this framework because then it gets really easy. It's easier to interpret than a block of text uh, or a pie chart. Um, and let's just, you know, this is, this is data from uh, specifically around electronic health record adoption. But I feel like for those of us that have done um, improvement work, this, is, this is extrapolates well to any work that we do even outside of the electronic health record. And that is that physicians or providers writ large have been slow to embrace new systems, even when they're available, uh, because it requires a lot of work, upfront investments and shifts in or apparent shifts within our efficiency. So this gets to one of my main points that I want you to take away uh, with and keep in your brain is that humans are, in general, lazy, forgetful creatures of habit. But we're evolutionarily driven, driven to be this way, right? Conservation of energy is how all species um, adapt and survive. And so we've, been, we've evolved to be lazy and forgetful creatures simply because it takes more energy or at least the perception of more energy. So uh, put that in your brain when we're trying to get people to change behavior. It's not their fault that they can't change. It's that we're, this is how we evolve and this is how we exist. And for those of us that are educators, that you've seen this ad nauseum, which is the uh, Ebbinghaus forgetting curve and that this is not only the lazy part, but the forgetting part is that we just are really bad 
at learning new information. So I know that by the end of this talk, you will probably remember, I don't know, 60 to 80% of that. And that by tomorrow, you'll remember maybe 45%. And then after a week, that's going to go down to like five to 10%. And as an educator, this is like really devastating because we know that just putting information in front of humans um, doesn't result in uptake. This is why spaced repetition, why frequent testing is actually uh, really effective in the learning environment. But hopefully what you'll walk away with today is larger concepts and they'll be able to layer some of that learning on top of it. But again, when you're thinking about trying to get people to provide better, safer, more equitable care, simply teaching them about it is not effective because we forget. And so I want to pivot into my second point here, which is I want you to know and understand this graphic. This graphic was, was developed by a graphic designer called Cassie McDaniel. If you really want to get into the weeds, she has a whole blog about how she used the evidence from literature to, der to derive this. But I think it's really fabulous because really it lays out when you're thinking of trying to make changes to get people to do something differently, there's a hierarchy to those interventions and how effective they're going to be. So you can see the things at the bottom things that are less effective in terms of changing behavior are listed at the bottom. They tend to be more people focused. So again, humans are lazy, forgetful creatures of habit. Um, they Education and training tends to be less effective. As you move up the effectiveness hierarchy, those things that are more effective tend to be more system focused, whether it's making things easier or standardized, automation, and then computerization, or even forcing functions. So let's walk through some examples of where these are ubiquitous within our uh, care systems. So anybody in here ever had like a badge card and been handed like a handout to say, hey, the next time you take care of sepsis, do these things. What happens to those, right? Like they sit in your white coat and then they get all crumpled up and then finally you're like, ah, I'm gonna throw this thing away. Or like, you know, badge cards, right? Like same thing, anybody ever worked at a hospital where it's like, here's a badge card to remember how to do something. They're just not that effective. And then we eventually feel bad and we have to throw away because the lamination's all gone and they're disgusting, right? So uh, it, education in and of itself, now it doesn't mean it doesn't have a role, but by itself just simply is not that effective of an intervention. Moving up the chain. So if you like to think about reminders, checklists and uh, double checks. So checklists really work, right? This is a screenshot of the WHO surgical safety checklist. Um, it has objectively saved lives worldwide as popularized by Atul Gawande and I think helped developed. Um, it works, but checklists, what are they predicated upon? People got to use them. So I did some work uh, around, uh, which you'll hear later around blood transfusions at my own institution. And one of the things that we found out was that our pathology department had developed this really robust guide for how much blood should be ordered for different procedures. They did it back in the early 2000s. It was really groundbreaking. Um, and then it sat in a drawer. This checklist sat in a drawer for decades until someone <laughs> opened up a drawer and sort of dusted it off and said, oh, wow, this would have been really effective over the last decade. But checklists are predicated among, amongst people using them. So they can work, but they're just not as effective because they're not forced. Now, at the top are forcing functions. And I feel like most of us, when we hear that as clinicians and as humans, we think, ooh, don't force me to do something. That feels awful. Like, you know, I, you know, I want you to res respect my autonomy as an expert clinician, whatever. Um, but I'm here to tell you that they can, if well-designed, can actually make your life better. So here's an example of something from my own life, um, from our own institution. I didn't have any role in this, but, and you all may have something like this that, are, that exists now, that uh, it used to be, back in my day, when you ordered a C. diff test, that you also had to remember to order the contact precautions that came with it. Now, this was particularly problematic. One, because I would always forget, so I'd get multiple pages a day. Hey, Dr. Anse, you ordered the C. diff test. Will you please put in the order for contact precautions? Sure, my bad, I'm sorry. You also had to remember to cancel them. Uh, so you know, patients would remain on contact precautions far longer than they needed to. Someone really smart came up with this and said, hey, why don't, just, why don't we just inextricably link those two things such that when you have a pending infectious test that if positive would require contact precautions, you probably have this for COVID and C. diff and other things as well, that the contact precautions just automatically come with that and that those don't go away until that test comes back as negative. In fact, full disclosure, I was involved in a case review because I uh, canceled a, C. Diff, a contact precautions for a patient that I thought had C. diff and then they stopped stooling. Then tests came back positive and this patient had gone to a procedure, had gone to CT. And so 
I got in trouble for canceling something that I should have never canceled. This forcing function of those two things being inextricably linked uh, makes my life a whole lot better. It reduces my number of pages and I go, don't get in trouble for, for canceling things prematurely. So forcing functions can actually make lives a whole lot better. All right, so let's let's put this into practice. So uh, this is outside of healthcare. Expand your brains a little bit. So this is a auto manufacturing plant. Uh, this lady in the red hat will call her Sally. Sally has one job. Sally's job is to put side view mirrors on cars. And Sally is really good at her job. She's the expert in the plant at doing this. Her rates that they track over time are about ninety five percent right. She gets it right ninety five percent of the time putting side view mirrors on cars. How could you? in thinking about the hierarchy of intervention effectiveness that I already talked about, how could you make it such that Sally could improve her rights? In fact, even her rates, how could you even make it such that Sally gets it right 100% of the time? We'd love for you to take a second, think to yourself, or if you're even so brave, put it in the chat. I'll give you a second. You better not say teach Sally how to do it right, because we all know that's not effective. Oh, Dr. Stern Steinberg, come on. I'm sure all mirrors are oriented. Yeah, there we go. Now we're getting it. Look at the 5% see if there's any patterns. Yeah, so check this out. So if you just simply change that the mirror can only go on one way, that's a forcing function to ensure that Sally can't put it on wrong in the first place. So that's a forcing function that makes Sally's life better because she doesn't have to do a checklist. She doesn't have to learn about this thing she already knows. And there's only way, one way to put it on. I feel like Ikea has sort of mastered this, right? There's only one way to put together the, the Schmurgle or whatever dresser you're trying to put together. <laughs> All right, so let's uh, pivot into the, the two other categories we're gonna talk about in terms of uh, nudges and financial incentives. So the first one I'll tackle is financial incentives. The first thing I'm gonna say off the bat is that financial incentives by themselves um, are not that effective in changing behavior, particularly if they're only announced one time. So I put them actually below education and training. That's sort of in the category of kind of like try harder um, because they're, sim they're simply one-time things. Now, I would argue that most financial incentives, the ones that are successful, which I'll share with you some examples in a second, um, that they actually are partnered with some of these other things. So not only is it, I'm going to give you money for doing this thing, I'm also going to remind you that I'm going to give you money for doing this thing or I'm gonna teach you about this thing that I want you to do differently, and I'm gonna give you money for it. So financial incentives in and in by themselves, I think are not an effective um, strategy, but when partnered with some of these others, they can be uh, effective. And then when we talk about nudges or choice architecture, those really can run the gambit depending on the thing that you're doing and the nudge that you're specifically using. So they may be a rule or a policy all the way up to computerization and automation. Importantly, which we'll cover, nudges are not forcing functions. So to be considered a nudge, uh, people have to have the option to be able to opt out, which by definition, a forcing function is not. So let's talk about uh, what these have looked like. So the first one that we'll dive into is financial incentives. So uh, this is a, a fabulous review article that came out in 2017 that looked at uh, providing financial incentives and improving value within healthcare. And here was kind of the summary of the literature of their findings, particularly around um, from behavioral psychology, where financial incentives work. So in general, they work really well for mechanical, low inference, repetitive activities. So they work really well for things that um, you sort of do again and again, uh, relatively sort of low inference, low cognitive effort um, activities. Medicine, that's sort of hard to think about what some of those things are, but I'll give you an example in a moment. Um, the next learning point from uh, behavioral psychology is that higher rewards in general tend to stimulate a greater effort, and, but it's not linear. And in fact, if the incentive is too small, for whatever reasons, humans sort of have a, a, a reaction to say, if it's, not, if it's too small, that's almost like insulting, and we're going to do worse than if there were not an incentive at all. Kind of interesting. Um, for more complex activities that require greater cognitive input, financial incentives can actually lead to poorer performance. And this feels a lot like a lot of what we do within medicine, right? Like really high cognitive effort and input. Um, and here's why, because one, it can uh, crowd out intrinsic motivation. People tend to get um, tunnel vision when they uh, are given a financial incentive. It diminishes creativity because there's less risk-taking. Uh, it may encourage cheating and shortcuts. 
and it might lead to selfish uh, behavior or uncooperative behavior, particularly if it's set up in a competitive manner. Now, this is dependent on the population that it's in. I can tell you that our own institution had really great success setting up a uh, competitive incentive structure, but it was really only worked well for surgeons. Surgeons are really competitive by nature, and so this all, all just appealed to their already competitiveness, and it works um, really well. And then, unfortunately, it can be addictive. And so you can actually see worse performance after the withdrawal of a final financial incentive, uh, worse than if you had never had that incentive in place, or you can sort of slide further back than what your baseline performance was. So it's not only a deviation back to the mean, it's actually worse than what the mean was before. So in considering these things, um, let's walk through uh, some examples from uh, some work that I've done over the last year at uh, University of Colorado. So we're spread across multiple hospitals, our GME is. Here's two of our hospitals, adult hospitals that our um, residents and fellows work at. And so uh, I'll focus on two areas. One was at uh, our institution called Denver Health. Um, this was around submitting patient safety reports. We felt like that fat felt fit into the category of a repetitive mechanical thing, rel relatively easy to replicate, just doing it again and again when you see a patient safety issue. So here are some of the details around how we set up the incentive program. And we set this up such that it was program level achievement. So we didn't care if uh, one chief resident submitted all patient safety reports for the entire residency, or if each this was distributed, we sort of said, you know, either all of internal medicine or all of surgery gets it or none of you get it for Denver Health. Then at University Hospital, this is our uh, main academic medical center. It's affiliated with UC Health here in Colorado. Um, this was around attending collaborative case reviews. Collaborative case reviews are essentially M&Ms, but with a systems focus on that. Um, again, we said that they could, uh, residents could attend between these dates. They had to document their attendance. And this was individual level achievement. So individual internal medicine residents, if they attended zero, one, or two, each individual would get a different payout. And we set it up such that it was split in half. So you, you were eligible to get 500 bucks from Denver Health and 500 bucks from uh, University Hospital if you achieved both of those metrics for a total of $1,000. And just to mention, this was kind of iterative over the years. We learned kind of the hard way historically that you can't get people uh, to perform um, better, especially for highly cognitive um, activities. So this is sort of our pivot into, let's do really repetitive, simple things submitting patient safety reports and submitting attendance uh, at a collaborative case review. And turns out this was really um, effective. So you can see over on the left that at Denver Health, um, the SI, this is the system that they did it in, reports filed per month per residence. You can see that, uh, that they averaged after they sort of got ramped up uh, around 150, 170 reports per month. And you might think ah, that sort of depends on the number of residents there, but if you look historically, so between 2014 and 2020, we had 70, anywhere from 70 to 150 reports per year total across the entire year. So you can see that by September, we had already exceeded our maximum number of reports from any of the previous years. Now, again, similar to what I said before, this was not just a financial incentive by itself. We also had reminders, this metric, these data came out every month. We sent uh, emails to residents. And by the way, we made it easier for residents to submit reports. We carried a drop, drop down. So, uh, we did some of those other things on that hierarchy in addition to providing a financial incentive, but it was successful. Then over at University Hospital, uh, collaborative case review attendance, you can see we started off relatively low in July. And then over time, this uh, we averaged around 200 um, CCRs attended per resident per, per month. Um, one of the things that I'll call out here is that the deadline, if you can guess, was in April. And you can see there was a dramatic increase uh, in attendance or logging attendance at CCRs in March. Not only are humans uh, lazy and forgetful, but we also tend to be procrastinators. And so you, you can see that reflected within our data. So one of the things that we, uh, you know, in looking at this, this is from advances in, in patient safety from the Institute of Medicine. This is again around specifically around EHR adoption. But these guiding principles, I feel like, really translate well to some of the stuff that, that we've seen uh, with our own work. And that is that in order to do this well, you need to involve the people that you're actually incenting to do something different. You should focus on activities that are important to patients and physician organization success. Um, you should differentiate motivation, like I don't want or I do want to do this thing, from the inability to do this thing. So one of our first failures in our incentive program for residents was incenting around hand washing. 
they just couldn't move the metric because it was distributed so much across all of the institution that individual residents or even residents as a block really couldn't improve our hand washing rates because it was so distributed. So they really didn't have the capability to do something different and to improve those rates. These should complement or at least not conflict with departmental and other compensation plans, right? Because creating financial dissonance is uh, obviously not going to be successful. You should design with input from physicians and other people involved. Using available metrics, that's a really critical one so people know how they're performing. And then this last one I will really emphasize is critical because no matter how you design something, you're going to learn about it as you go along the way. One of the things we learned from patient safety reporting at Denver Health was that their reporting culture and their safety culture needed some work. And we didn't know that until we started incentivizing residents to submit patient safety reports. But we've had to and are continually having to do work around, you know, patient safety reporting is something that we want everybody to do. This is not a punitive thing. So we've really had to do some of that work. And we didn't know that until we um, pushed this uh, as something to do, because we only had, you know, 70 reports over the entire year, uh, historically moving up uh, from there. So you really have to remain flexible and uh, evolve and do some other work, because it may reveal um, underlying things that you didn't know about before. So let's pivot away from financial incentives and move into the uh, what I think is the most exciting part of this, which is um, nudges and choice architecture. So this uh, work was really popularized and really um, uh, brought to um, consciousness and really put together by um, two authors. So Richard Thaler, who's a winner of Nobel Prize in economic, economics, as well as Cass Sunstein, um, through their book called Nudge. This is a, a bestseller for, for obvious reasons. So let's talk about what a nudge is. And that's uh, defined within the book as any aspect of choice architecture, we'll get that to in a second, that alters people's behavior in a predictable way without, remember I said, without forbidding options or changing, significantly changing economic incentives. So here's an example from the book. To count as a nudge, it must be easy and cheap to avoid. They're not mandates. So for example, putting fruit at eye level counts as a nudge. Uh, getting rid of junk food does not because it doesn't make it available. It's not a choice. Uh, you're removing that choice uh, as an option. So let's talk about what choice architecture means because I feel like that requires um, some uh, definition here. And then I'll get to your uh, question in a second, Dr. Udesky. Um, and that is that the design of different ways in which choices can be presented to decision makers and the impact of the presentation uh, in that decision making. I'm happy to pause. Uh, looks like Dr. Udesky has a question for me. Or maybe that's just a errant hand raise. Okay, I'm gonna keep moving, but I, you know, you're welcome to throw it in the chat as well. Okay, uh, the other thing that I really like from this book where that they laid out uh, was this really clever term called libertarian paternalism. And that is that it's possible and legitimate for private and public institutions such as our own to affect behavior while also respecting freedom of choice. I feel like that is really critical, particularly in medicine, particularly when we're dealing with highly trained um, people, including clinicians, uh, that you have to respect their um, clinical intuition and expertise because medicine is complicated, because we train for so long, you have to kind of respect that. And this applies really well to medicine. So libertarian and paternalism sort of separated into like influencing choices um, as better as judged by the person that's being influenced. And then libertarian meaning people can opt out of the specified arrangements if they choose to do so. So really applicable to experts, getting experts in medicine to change. So here's one uh, example provided uh, by the book. Um, I think probably around 50% of our audience will uh, recognize that uh, spillage from stand-up urinals uh, is a problem in men's bathrooms. Um, in fact, uh, the, this was done, this originally work was done in Amsterdam in this public restroom. They noticed that there was a significant sick amount of spillage. So they did this intervention uh, where they put a picture of a fly within the urinal. Now, again, for about 50% of our uh, attendees today, around 50%, I'm guessing, based on uh, gender, uh, or actually maybe sex is more accurate in this um, example, is that if you give uh, a man a target, uh, they're more likely to go for it. And turns out this significantly reduced spillage as measured in this Dutch men's bathroom. Uh, Sanjay Saint from uh, University of Michigan used this as an example before, and he kind of made an off-color joke that essentially that this 
uh, that it reduced spillage with a significant p-value. I can't take credit for that, but that's so good. So, all right. So this, this works to nudge, influence better uh, bathroom behavior. Uh, one that's more applicable, I think, or relative to uh, our um, work within medicine is that uh, this uh, they talk about in the book and talking looking at um, organ donation rates. So they did a couple of seminal work that was published in uh, Journal of Science, where essentially saying like looking at default options for um, donor consent. So the options are to opt in, saying as we do in most states in this in this country, uh, which is uh, I am not an organ donor unless I select to be one. Uh, or opt out, everyone is an organ donor unless they specify that they're not. And in this specific uh, online experiment, they actually had a neutral option where they didn't opt in or opt out, just ask people to kind of choose. And it turns out that the opt out was significantly more impactful than the opting in. And this has been replicated and, and translated across multiple countries. So countries that have an opt out policy have a relatively low organ donation rate. And this is replicated across states as well. And uh, countries or states that have an opt-out policy, um, their organ donation rates or people that are signed up as organ donors are significantly higher. Again, this gets back to, right, humans are uh, fundamentally lazy and forgetful, right? Like if you just sort of make it where we are, we're less likely to choose not to do that. But importantly, it correlates with what people would natively choose by themselves. That's what that neutral option showed. So opting out is a, is a powerful nudge. We'll talk about that. So I'm gonna pause here. It looks like we have a question in the chat. Oh, no, this is just uh, getting some CME credit. Cool, all right, so moving on. So there's a couple of different categories of nudge architecture um, that I think is important to sort of think about and frame this. One is uh, one, they're around decision structure, decision information, and then decision assistance. So let's walk through these in more detail. So decision structure is how you structure that decision. Um, I already gave you the example of a default option. Turns out, um, in fact, this is a nice meta-analysis from outside of medicine um, that looks at the effectiveness of nudges as a meta-analysis. And it turns out setting a default option was far and away the most impactful uh, in terms of driving uh, behavioral change. Um, other things you can do is change the ease of choosing certain options, changing the salience of certain options, so making it more noticeable or a bad option less noticeable. And there's exam some examples listed on there for you. All right, the next is around uh, decision information. That's uh, examples of these. One is providing a social reference point. We're all familiar for this when you uh, go to swipe your credit card for buying a latte or whatever, you can see there are suggested uh, tip amounts. I don't know if you've noticed this, but I feel like they've changed recently, depending on where I go, like that the one or $2 options now gone and it's all like a percentage point. It's like, wait a minute. It, but it takes a lot of work to sort of like say, ah, I don't, that feels like, $5 on a $7 latte feels like a lot to tip is my sort of point. But if you provide a social reference point, people are more likely to choose that thing. So if you're asking people to make donations, if you say most people donate $20, then most people will donate $20. Or if you say most people donate $40, most people will donate $40. So providing a social reference point can influence decision making. Also making information more visible, uh, that can influence decisions, which makes sense, I think. The next one is around decision assistance. This uh, reminding people to do something uh, can impact their decisions. Uh, within the EHR, I think uh, you, you and I all know and love these as best practice alerts. Are you sure you wanna do this? Are you, are you really sure? Changing option consequences, so adjusting incentives, not necessarily financial, but there could be other incentives around uh, consequence of the specific behavior. And then facilitating commitment. Educators know this, that if you ask learners to remember one thing, that they're more likely to remember it in the future. Or if you get someone to publicly stand up and say, this is something that we should all be doing. When they're by themselves, it's a lot harder for them to not do that thing, right? You're creating cognitive dissonance where they got to do that thing because they stood up in front of everybody and said, yeah, this is something I'm behind. So that can be really uh, impactful. So here's an example um, from my own life that I didn't even know was a nudge at the time. It's sort of something we kind of came up with and thought we would try. This is close to when the book came out. We sort of just did it, but it worked. So I was uh, privileged enough to serve as our one of our house staff association co-presidents. So this is back in 2014. And our membership rates were around 20%. It was, that, it was when we had an opt-in policy. So we, the next following year, we said, let's make it an opt out such that, you know, we feel like we represent all of the house staff and act on their behalf. So let's make them do some extra work to opt out. 
And historically, since then, our membership rates have been around 90 to 95%. So significantly better simply by saying, you can make the same choice. You can choose to be a member or not, but we're going to make it a little bit harder for you not to be. So before I even knew what a nudge was, I blindly stumbled across something that was eventually a nudge. All right, so let's get into more clinical stuff. Um, some of the work that I've done uh, at University of Colorado is around reducing vena punctures. Um, so we all know that blood draws are obviously a necessary part of medical care, but they also create a lot of harm. One, they hurt. Uh, two, it reduces patient experience. And three, uh, patients get anemic uh, when uh, they're hospitalized in our hospitals uh, to a significant degree, it turns out. And so we did some work around how to reduce vena punctures. Um, we did some work at one of our sister institutions had already done some work around this, and that was uh, doing an edge to restrict daily lab ordering. So you could no longer order you know, CBC QAM until the end of time or until discharge. They had already done that work and showed some significant improvements. My institution recently did this uh, around daily chest x-ray ordering, and that the rates, the, the, the graph just essentially falls off a cliff. Uh, again, you can still order a chest x-ray every day. You just have to manually order a chest x-ray or a CBC every day. So making it harder to do the thing that we don't want you to do. Uh, where I got involved was creating that reminder, a BPA, that was essentially centered around, one, a reminder, two, providing more information. And that was if a patient's CBC was normal the previous 24 hours, we said, hey, patient's CBC was normal yesterday. Do you really need to check it today? And then we ask people to justify why. Was there a clinical change? Is it for drug monitoring? Something other. Again, letting people continue to do it, but saying, hey, are you sure that you want to do this? And turns out, I'll have you pay attention mostly to the gray line. That was effective. Our goal was to reduce this uh, over the course of the year by 15%. And we were able to increase our goal, uh, hit our goal and sustain it for uh, at least a couple of weeks. Um, you can see it started, it started to drift up, but Overall, the trend was improved, meaning less rates of uh, vena punctures due to CBCs and BMPs, which is what, what we were measuring. So an effective intervention. The next one that I'll focus on is around uh, pick line placement. Um, so as, as uh, those of us know, uh, pick lines are a critical device for providing central access medications. They're also required uh, for patients to go home with IV medications because most home health companies don't accept midlines. Um, but we know that they come with risks. So um, proportional to the diameter of the catheter uh, within the vein, um, increased rates of um, venous thromboembolism as well as infection rates. So the smaller the catheter, the less length of the catheter, um, generally the better in terms of complications. This was work uh, done by my now chair of medicine at University of Colorado when he was in Michigan. Um, Dr. Chopra and others really um, uh, came out with the guidelines and created these guidelines around appropriateness for um, peripheral IV catheter insertion. So our project goals were to really to align with these magic criteria, and they were to really increase the proportion of midline catheters and decrease the number of lumens uh, when picks were placed and indicated. So what we did was uh, essentially modify the EHR to have some of these nudges with them. So here was our historical order. It was you know in a single order and doctor, provider, you could order whatever you wanted. No guidance whatsoever. Just said, do you want a single lumen, double lumen, triple lumen, power pick? Honestly, I don't know what the difference is between a triple lumen and a power pick or how many lumens those are. So, you know, people would sort of just choose what they thought was better. And I feel like a lot of times we think more is generally better. So uh, we had really high rates of triple lumen catheter placement, um, as well as higher rates of VTEs and CLABSIs than we wanted to see. So what we did was we changed that from a single order into an order set. We added some information at the top saying, hey, by the way, that a midline is appropriate. If it's appropriate, you should use it. Multiple, cat multiple catheters increases the risk. Um, and if it's a CKD dialysis patient, um, don't put in a pick line at all. You should need to put in a cone catheter. So that was some reminder, some information, choice information. And then instead of saying, doctor, what kind of line would you want to place? We said, why are you placing the line? And we arranged it such that they're the, by the indications, so whether they're discharging with a line, short-term IV access, long-term IV access, whatever the reason was, we asked them to indicate that. And then depending on their answer, they got a different list, a different menu of options. So if the patient was uh, getting IV access for short-term, then we guided them into getting, uh, uh, but, but it was for you know, vasopressors of chemotherapy, guiding them into getting a pick line. If it was for frequent phlebotomy and we thought it was gonna be less than six days, then we guided them into getting a midline. So really 
different menu of options depending on what the indication was. Uh, and so that's whether someone chooses a pick line or a midline. Then we change the actual order itself. And I apologize that the, this came out so blurry, uh, but essentially we said, okay, uh, desired number of lumens. And they put in some nudges in here. We said, okay, single lumen is preferred. Humans tend to sort of gravitate towards this. We're not sure like, oh, that's preferred. I should choose that one. Um, if we wanted to be stronger, we would have defaulted to a single lumen. Uh, dub, double lumen indication for incompatible infusions and then triple lumen saying it was restricted, right? Again, when you look at this stuff and human sort of natural behavior, especially moving quickly, it's like, oh, that's restricted. I probably shouldn't do that thing generally. Um, so this is what the intervention looked like. So here are our results. For those that haven't seen this type of uh, graph or analysis before, this is called an interrupted time series. We did do this because you can see that actually people were already getting better on their own before we started their intervention. So we did a cut point in the data and essentially modeled out what would it look like had we not and if we, as a result of doing this intervention, you can see that having a midline uh, was had a significant, in, had a one-time increase in the slope of the line change as a proportion of all the lines. So we increased the number of midlines we placed as a proportion to all lines. Next one, looking at decreasing pick line usage as a proportion of all lines, sort of the corollary of that. You can see we were already getting better over time, but saw a similar reflection, but in the downtrend of pick line placement. And here's the biggest one that we saw which was around increasing the proportion of single lumen picks as a proportion of all pick line catheters. You can see that we were actually getting worse over time, that we were not placing single lumen catheters. And as a result of our intervention, we saw an increase, uh, a reversal of that slope and, an, and a change in um, the amount of uh, single lumen catheters that, were, uh, that we were placing. Um, just a, a recommendation here, don't um, you know, design a study to cross over a, uh, global pandemic. That's why you see we cut this at January 2020, because then that's sort of the, the data gets uh, sort of harder to interpret beyond that point. All right. The last example that I'm going to share with you is around blood transfusions. So again, similar to pick lines, a necessary part of medical care, but in excess um, can result in higher morbidity, higher mortality for patients. So uh, we know that there are generally accepted recommendations. This is put out by the AABB for red blood cell transfusions um, around you know, generally transfusing less uh, because um, uh, stored blood is not the same as native blood. And oh, by the way, uh, blood transfusions cost around $700 per unit of blood transfused, both the direct cost of the blood and then all of the administrative other things around that nursing time preparation time, uh, and that's proportional to every unit of blood that's uh, administered. We looked at our data and saw that outside of the operating room, outside of mass transfusion protocol for inpatient transfusions, about 50% of them across our health system did not meet these guidelines. So we said, great, we have an opportunity to improve. And so what we did was really diving into the weeds of which choices can we present to people and which ones are effective. We did a randomized controlled trial of providers at our institution and showed different providers, different things. So everybody in each arm got modifications to the order set. And then we added some other nudges or choice architecture on top of that in terms of alerts. So let me walk you through what the moder order set modifications were. And they were specifically around the prepare order. I'm not sure if it looks like this at your institution, but we have a separate prepare order and a transuse order. I'm seeing Angie saying yes, so that's great. Uh, so at our institution, when we started, and hopefully you don't think we're completely nuts for having this way, or if you do, then maybe there's an opportunity to improve, where on the preparer is prepare anywhere from one to 20 units. That's like insanity, right? Like nobody ever chose 20 units. That just wasn't a button that uh, was ever used when we looked at the data. But what this does, if you think about it, that it sort of normalizes. Like if I'm not ordering 20 units, like that sounds awful, but I'm only ordering four. That's substantially less. So like four, it doesn't sound that bad. So one of the changes that we made was to set a default option at prepare one unit at a time. Users could, and we tested with this and they felt facile doing this. They could change this to 20 units if they wanted to, but we defaulted it to one unit. The other thing that we did was that the transfusion indications were in the prepare order, not in the transfuse order. And that felt nonsensical to us because you know the prepare order might be because they're coming with an upcoming procedure, uh, but it wasn't actually the decision to transfuse in that prepare order. So the other thing we did is we moved those indications to the uh, transfuse order. And the other thing you can see is that our indications were like wholly unhelpful for understanding why people were transfusing. Parity operative anemia and other, like uh, that's not helpful in any kind of way. It doesn't tell me any, any information. So on the transfuse order, again, we mirrored what we did in the prepare order was restricting it to one unit, but changing so you could go 20 units if you wanted to. 
and then moving the transfusion indications. And we made the indications be guideline concordant, such that you had to choose a guideline-based indication for why you were transfusing somebody. Hopefully getting people in their brain to think, oh, I don't see my indication here. Maybe I need to rethink this in a moment or put in other because my attending told me to do so or whatever. The other thing that we did was around the indications that if your hemoglobin was 6.9 or less or less than seven, we didn't ask you, right? We made it because we know that's a guideline-based indication regardless of why you're transfusing. So we said, okay, if you are transfusing for hemoglobin less than seven, we're not going to ask you the indication because we already know it. Then what happens is someone tries to transfuse above a hemoglobin of seven, then they see this, and this is going to be different than when they did it the last time. So again, another pause to say, huh, this is different than last time. Maybe I should think about this a little bit more. And uh, what we also did, so that was for everybody. We also then said, okay, what if we add reminders on top of it? What does that do to our data? And so we did an inline, meaning non-interruptive uh, reminder that said, hey, are you sure you want to do this? There may be potential harm, but it didn't pop up. It didn't stop you from doing what you're doing otherwise. And we compared that to in the third arm, which was a BPA that said the same thing. Are you sure you want to do this? And tell us why you're going to be doing this. So three different arms, order set only, order set plus a reminder, but doesn't interrupt you. And then an interruptive alert. And it turns out there was no difference between those groups. BPA, inline alert, and just making things better had no difference, which was kind of what we thought that we were going to see and sort of hoped what we wanted to see. I shouldn't say that as a researcher, like what you hope for, but that's, I feel like it makes sense, right? That you don't need to remind somebody, just design it better in the first place. And here are our results. So this doesn't look that impactful, but when you sort of look through the numbers because our numbers are so high, that you can see that again, another interrupted time series, you can see that our compliance was getting better over time. And this is an aggregate of, of guideline concordant. It looks different based on hemoglobin level in number of units, but this is sort of aggregate data, that this was statistically significant seeing it one time bump and an increase as a result of our intervention. So people are more guideline concordant as a result of this intervention. Now, what I think is really cool is from our BPA arm, and now we've put this into the other arms, is that we are able to now capture that uh, 1,200 out of 4,200 times, um, people were opening the order set and then closing it choosing not to transfuse blood. We'd actually never been able to capture that before. So this is also something really cool because that's really what we want to see, right? Like how do you capture what people don't do? This is a mechanism to do that. So 1200 times out of 4200, people decided not to transfuse blood as a result of seeing uh, the alerts that we saw. So a few caveats, because I feel like I've gone through a lot of things and you're like, all right, I'm gonna do nudges everywhere. Uh, the first thing to consider is that, you know, you need to understand your problem first. This is a critical tenet of inequality improvement, and that is that you got to know what you're trying to fix and what the problems are before you start throwing in EHR or other interventions. I'm presently working with a pathology group that uh, they came to us saying they wanted to change some of their orders. Uh, turns out no one ever uses that order. So we could do a lot of work to design a beautiful order that no one's ever going to use. Now the work is understanding why people don't use that order in the first place. So before you go out and start making changes to Epic, uh, understand your problem first and make sure that your intervention needs to be an EHR based. The second one is, and this is uh, some individuals at your institution are doing this exact work, and that is engage your users. When you're making changes, whether it's to an EHR or to any kind of new process, Talk to the people involved in doing that. They will tell you insights of where the problems lie and how to do things better, much better than you can come up with on your own. In fact, our blood transfusion work, that showing transfusion indications to people only based on if the hemoglobin was seven or greater, uh, that came from doing user-centered design work that uh, is pending in a publication um, coming up soon. Um, just got the proofs yesterday, which is pretty cool. Uh, so asking people, you know, what do they think? And they will tell you much more creative things than you could probably come up with on your own. So a few caveats here. Don't go throw nudges everywhere and talk to the people that you're, uh, that are going to be impacted by your work uh, because it'll, uh, your work will be better for it. So in summary, humans are lazy, forgetful creatures of habit, but you can harness that using default options and some of these other things that I talked about in order to get them to do things differently. We all want to do things differently, which just our evolution makes it really hard. There is a hierarchy of effectiveness of different interventions that you choose, so choose wisely. 
Uh, financial incentives can have a role, but I, I think that they're relatively limited in isolation. And then finally, think about some of these other things where you can help people do the right thing and make it harder to do the wrong thing along the lines of clinical care. Uh, so I want to use a nudge here, facilitating commitment. This is a learner strategy. I want everyone on this call to put in the chat, however you can do that, one thing you're going to remember from this talk. I'll give you 30 seconds to do that. By, your, by the way, you're doing this publicly, so you have to remember it. Great, keep filing those in because if you commit to memorizing it, to remembering it, you will remember, more likely to remember. Just want to throw out some acknowledgments. This, this is absolutely a team sport and I could not have done uh, a lot of this work without others. Um, so those listed on the screen, uh, big shout out. Also big shout out to Dr. Berger here for uh, recommending me for, uh, for joining you all, which has been fabulous. And with that, I will close and I'll take questions. And Alfred, I'll, tar I'll jump to your question first. And this, how do you know that people weren't, you know, opening the order having a discussion otherwise. Great question. Uh, we don't know that for sure. That's super preliminary. What we've done now is created um, silent BPAs where we can see that people open the order set and if they decide to transfuse um, to see if that uh, translates across um, as we transition into, into our next phase of our, our study. So um, good question. I, I don't know if I can attribute to the nudges to that, but we do have some pre-data now and moving forward, hopefully we'll be able to compare that out. Thank you for the answer. Uh... Uh, um, yeah, I, I just find it interesting because even if it didn't stop them, it did make them reconsider. So rather than counting those as sort of like never events or, or an outcome in and of itself, look at all these transfusions that didn't happen. They maybe had to go back. And I would look specifically at how many of those fell into then the other category, like, oh, I got a warning. Yeah, no, we're just going to do it anyway. Okay, other, we're doing it anyway. Yeah. Um, it, I, I think that would be the really interesting part of you got them to pause, but not necessarily stop and um, versus how many paused and, and stopped it, it kind of an interesting it was a subgroup within that anyway. Yeah, and we, we actually did look at that and it, and it turns out most of those um, sort of stayed true such that we looked at if they didn't order blood again for the next um, four hours, we considered that an you know, a effective behavior change four hours being enough time to say, okay, either clinical change or I talked to somebody and they talked me back into it or whatever. Yeah. Um, so we, we, that, that did relatively hold true, but you're, you're exactly right of like, what does that actually mean? I'm not totally sure, but pretty cool that we can capture something that someone didn't do because Epix is specifically built around orders and what people do do in the era of high value care. We're trying to get people to do less. So how do you capture doing less? Oh yeah, no, it's amazing that uh, now we know you can do that because we're constantly told you can't do that right. when we asked to query something. Right. So it's amazing that you all were able to get IT to query that. Next to that, that report was generated through Slicer Dicer. So we were able to like query it ourselves, which is kind of cool. Other questions or comments from the crowd? While we're waiting, maybe I'll ask a quick question because um, I'm interested in how this information gets sort of propagated out there. I feel like with, you know, sort of clinical changes, people are pretty quick to publish and um, and sort of disseminate the information. My sense, although I feel free to correct me, is that when I try to search these things in PubMed or whatever, people see these as more sort of like operational improvements locally and don't necessarily publish each you know, individual epic tweak when, you know, we're mostly on the same EMR, we're mostly dealing with the same challenges. Our folks are no more or less uh, lazy and forgetful than, than your folks. How, isn't there a better way to just, you know, now that we've sorted, you know, solved this transfusion problem, like, let's just fix it everywhere. Yeah, I, 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 it's a fabulous question. And it gets down to how do you 
how do you share information across a population? And when you dramatically increase the size of the population, that's going to have its own challenges. So thinking about, you know, diffusion of innovation work and how does information get spread? Um, you know, is there a role for Epic to have some of this work in there where they say like, hey, by the way, this other institution had this and be a central point? I think that's one. The most extreme option would be, and, 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 you know, this is kind of uh, academic to think about, but like, you know, if our EHR is so able to modify how clinicians behave, that's sort of dangerous. And show, should there actually be regulations around that? I don't want that, but at the same time, you know, that the, the conversation kind of naturally goes there. So it's, it's a fabulous question, but you know, how do you share this stuff? I think you share it as best you can. And just to say that if anybody wants to partner, I'm happy to partner with you and working with your, <laughs> some of your transfusion work. Yeah, Alfred, go ahead. Yeah, since uh, I'll throw out another one. Um, to me, it seems like this all falls very well into the idea of um, a high reliability construct in that you, you know, I think I could think about our own pick work. We've had many people present stuff. We have a pick line team and they've helped generate a lot of this guidance, but what if we suddenly didn't? How do, would we maintain that level of knowledge? And I think that um, this idea of creating um, processes that don't rely, right? So one of the big things is resilience um, and some are deference of hierarchy. And I think that that often, the transfusion and the pick lines are the two things. Um, the pick lines can be maintained through a stable pick line team because you always have to have someone right. who puts it in. Some places have frontline providers putting it in, right? They train all the hospitalists to do it ultrasound based. And then you lose a lot of control and you need these solid guardrails. But with a team there, you, you sort of maintain control as sort of the industrial control, right? right? But with the transfusion, you have what's called a lot of deference to authority, right? The hematologist said it's okay. Therefore, it must be a good use of blood, right. um, for, even though they're operating outside their own guidelines. So I think that um, when I, hearing this talk, it was amazing and thank you again. Um, but like there are so many crossovers in the different areas of health system science that this is one component that can, in any framework, whether we call it high value care or high reliability organizations can really come together. And um, it just speaks to how hearing a talk like this for me is so, um, inspiring. In fact, one of the house staff last night picked up that there had been some changes in the admission orders where clearly some stakeholder got a bunch of things in the auto click. And um, now everybody's getting a one or two labs and we're going to probably have to work with our IT department to figure out why are these labs that are not necessary for everybody default clicked off and you know now we're getting inflammatory markers like esrs and crps right. on every single person admitted regardless of what they're here for tyler right. we'll give you like 20 seconds to respond to that and then we gotta yeah absolutely i mean i, th I think it comes down to you know one understanding your local milieu you know do you have a pick team or do you have hospitals placing it and then and then the other is you know why are changes being made and can you track them over time i think those are the, the critical things to think about and what implications do they have we have to all be really comfortable with things changing over time so again, I'll, I'll pause there. Thank you so much for, for Thank having you. This me. Thank you. This was great. Thanks so much for, for joining us. Take care, everybody. Yeah, you're very welcome. Thank you.